Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and a few guests who will introduce themselves shortly. Uh, last week, we finished up our three-part discussion on the Trinity. Uh, we talked about how God is in himself interpersonal and sustains relationships in a structured way with promises. Promises to perform given activities, promises to give power and rewards for those activities. So there's the structure to relationships even within the Godhead. And today we're going to sort of continue and step past that with how God structures relationship with us, his creatures. But let's introduce our friends. Brian, you've been with us before, but remind us who you are. Hi, my name's Brian. I'm longtime friends of pretty much everyone here, except for the new person who's joining us. California resident, native, not a fan of avocado toast, though. We're not that far gone. Yeah. That's really? Me. No avocado toast? Do you have something against avocado in general or just yes, actually, avocado toast? But, uh, yeah. I know it's not hey, un- same, it's, it's an actually. unpopular opinion. I'm glad that you are also of yeah. the faith. <laughs> People are always like, what? You don't like avocados, but you're from California. And I'm like, no, avocados are gross. They are. Anyway, like, anyway I, we could go on. Anyway, Alice, what is your opinion on avocados and the toast I, thereof? Oh my goodness. Well, I, I, I'm going to be the unpopular opinion here, I think, and say that I definitely love avocados. Um, as for avocado toast I'm not especially partial one way or the other it's just kind of goes with liking avocados that I wouldn't mind it (laughs) and where are you from Alice I am from South Carolina um, but I am here in the DC area and for those who don't know I am friends of the Maxons um, so just just from the area and I'm excited to join the discussion and learn a little bit tonight we're excited to have you thank you so Greg what is a covenant you know, if you ask any dozen theologians that question, you're probably going to get a dozen answers. Everything from an agreement to something far more detailed. Last time we were talking, we asked the question, can we speak of the members of the Trinity being covenanted together? And the conclusion I think we came to was we can, but we have to realize that when we talk about God as he is in himself, everything's going to be a little different. God does not think or understand or love the way we do. He's God. And everything that we do and live out is analogical. It's he's the archetype, we're the image. So when we start talking, we we don't have to come up with a definition that includes him, except in the most broad sense. And you've already sort of done that. We're talking about fellowship, we're talking about communion, with goals in mind, not just friends who hang out and play Rook or something because they've got nothing better to do or watch Princess Bride because there's not much better to do, <laughs> but actually have some kind of purpose. And eventually we're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about the name of this podcast, Halting Towards Zion, and what in the world that has to do with covenant. But in the meantime, let me read you a um, few verses from Psalm 105. Apparently people would like us to cite our references and slow down. <laughs> the psalmist says this about covenants. Speaking of the Lord, he says, He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham, and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. And there's more, but Notice all the synonyms. We're talking about the covenant, but it's a word that God commanded. He commanded it to a thousand generations. He also calls it an oath. He calls it a law. And he comes back again and says it's everlasting and ties it off by saying its substance is an inheritance. Now, people have argued about whether or not you can nail down exactly how many parts or facets or dimensions a covenant has. I think you can, but that's not the main point here. The the Bible gives us a number of things right there we can work with. I'm going to say five, and there's a theological flow here. Uh, And and once we see that and we begin looking around the Bible, we start running into a lot of things that come in fives, like the Torah, for instance. 
But we have God who is sovereign, the God who issues a law and makes commandments. We have the idea of him making it with a person or a representative. We probably should talk a little more about that. It's called a law. It's called promise. So God promises that he will do things. He requires us to do things. The word oath shows up uh, when people cut covenants. They swear self-maledictory oaths. I, I will do this, and if I fail to do this, may my uh, body be cut open, my entrails poured out, and my flesh fed to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And finally, it's to a thousand generations. It's to believers and their seed after them. The words that we've used at our school have been lordship, representation, stipulations, oath and blessing, or oath and sanction, and continuity, succession, inheritance. You can use other words, but these, these ideas, these theological realities, these ways that God pulls us into a relationship with himself and to one another show up in all the covenants that are labeled covenants in Scripture. So we, we have some common material. We have to be careful of not making them airtight because the psalmist here sure didn't. They flow, the ideas flow one into another. You're making an oath to call down sanctions about an inheritance, and you're doing this as a representative of the sovereign God who's spoken to you in his word. You get the idea. So the purpose of all these points, of all these facets are united in that there's a legal and personal bond that's being created. A legal and personal bond. I think I wrote that in one of my syllabuses someplace. You probably did. I probably stole it. <laughs> Personal in that it is not merely an external requirement of duties. To make it simple, marriage is not about keeping a list of rules. <laughs> Church membership is not about a list of rules or checking off boxes. There is true relationship, which involves personality, love, commitment. But God structures this. He does not leave it to the, the impulse of the moment. He does not leave it to sentiment doesn't leave it to passion. How do I feel right now? Am I still married today? I don't know. How do I feel about this? He does not do that. <laughs> Am I a loyal citizen of the United States today? I don't know. How do I feel about the president? Let me check before I answer that question. <laughs> Covenant loyalty is something that either God imposes, depending on the nature of the covenant, or that we freely pick up. Or God creates the covenant institution, and we sometimes have a choice. You can choose to marry this person or that person, but you don't get to redefine marriage. You can be a citizen of this nation or that nation, but you don't get to define the nation, the, the whole idea of, of nationhood and civil government. And most certainly, you don't get to redefine the doctrine of the church. You can belong to this church or that church, but if you are born again, if you come by faith to Christ, God puts his people, he engrafts them into the church. He adds to the church those that are to be saved. So that's at least a general starting point. Yes, it's an agreement. Yes, it's kind of like a contract, but the issues are life and death. It's a bundle of being bound up in a bundle of life with the Lord. And there are the, the most important covenants of Scripture we think of in terms of our salvation, being a little selfish, <laughs> that uh, we, we, we want to know, how, how am I related to God? The, the, the evangelical line, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Well, you know what? Everyone has a personal relationship with Jesus. They either personally love him or personally hate him. But there's no neutral ground. That opens the door to another discussion later on. But we are covenant creatures. We are either covenant keepers or covenant breakers. The, uh, the other thing I think we have to throw in here is covenant is an inevitable because of everything we've said up to this point, because we can't be God, because he's the creator and, and we're creatures, because there can be no crossing of that metaphysical boundary, the only way God can relate to us personally is by covenant. Now, he can, he can run the universe, he can declare our destinies, but if he's going to talk to us or, or love us, it's going to be by covenant, not by mystical interpenetration. We don't get to rise to the level of divinity. We don't get to be God. And so he condescends to this thing, this relationship that we call covenant. Relationship, yeah. Um, at school, a few weeks, ago, a couple months ago, I guess, one of the teachers said, hey, Greg, I just have an idea. Is it all right to call a, a covenant a relationship? Oh, no. 
<laughs> yeah, I, 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 I hope I wasn't rude. I think I just kind of blinked a few times. I said, yeah, that's 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 great. The question is what kind. Yeah. Uh, our generation is great about relationships. Facebook, I, I, know, I don't know if all social media has it. I imagine it does. Are you in a relationship? What in the world does that mean? <laughs> I mean, on one level, everything in the universe is related to everything else. We have the same God. We exist in terms of matter and three-dimensional space, time, so on. What kind of relationship? Well, covenant relations are very particular, and the nature of the most basic are defined for us in Scripture. And I guess that's what we want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so let's start off. You sort of listed the five points that we wanted to talk about sort of in bullet succession. So let's yeah, slow down and take each of them in turn. Uh, so first of all, lordship or sovereignty, I guess you would say, is a synonym for that. Sovereignty, suzerainty, if you want to use an old Hittite word. It means God's in control. Really? Yeah. That's a Hittite word? Suzerainty. The, the whole uh, field of covenant studies perked up in the um, late 18, early 1900s when people began to discover, well, archaeology became a thing. It hadn't been. Mm. And uh, people began to, well, first of all, discover there actually were Hittites, and the Bible was right about that. Surprise, surprise. And then Hittite treaties began to show up, and they seemed to be very well organized, and they have a particular format. And theologians began to say, well, look, maybe this is where the Bible got its ideas. Or, <laughs> but there, because of the, the predictability of form, theologians began asking questions. Well, is, is there a format for biblical covenants? And people began to look around and, and look at the material, particularly Deuteronomy, which is a covenant renewal document, and began to see that there are, there are similarities between what the Bible does and between what Hittite covenants do. But as you have frequently have said, and I think the last thing, we, we start with with a, a covenant. It, the thing about Hittite covenants, the king declares them unilaterally. These are not mm -hmm. covenants of parity between equal individuals. And so when we talk about a covenant that God makes or that we make with an appeal to God. God's in charge. He's God. That one's automatic. We shouldn't have to think about it. Uh, unfortunately, we do need to think about it because we're sinners and we don't like God to tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. But that's the starting point. God is either the originator, covenant of works, covenant of grace, marriage, um, church, civil government. Mm -hmm. So or, the example of that would be in the marriage ceremony, we are gathered together in the sight of God. Yes. And usually there's a reference to Jesus who... Uh, adorned the fir adorned uh, marriage by his first miracle of Cana and Galilee. That's not just a passing. Wow, isn't this a neat coincidence? That's a reminding that both under the old covenant of the new, God is the Lord of marriage. Uh, I remember a young friend of mine who had just recently come to Christ and was listening to this is ages ago was lis listening apparently to some kind of tape I had done. I don't know Heidelberg Catechism or something. And she said, yeah, I didn't, be, before today, I didn't understand that marriage was for the glory of God. Wow, that's, I'm glad you understand that now. It just didn't occur to me that somebody would name the name of Christ, even as, as a very young Christian, and not understand that God's the Lord of marriage and ordains what marriage is like. And yet today, kind of an important thing. As I said earlier, we yeah. don't get to reinvent marriage. God defines it. He's the Lord of it. So we, we, could, we could take this through church and state, but I assume you want to keep it simple for now. Yeah, we need to keep moving. But I mean, that is an a easy mistake to make, I think. Like, even if you've grown up on the Westminster Catechism that says before anything else, everything is for God's glory. Man's chief end is to glorify God. Like, it's easy to know that answer and then think, does that mean the way that I arrange my house is for the glory of God? Does that mean... The way I drive my car is to the glory of God, because uh, we might need to talk about my uh, road rage. <laughs> so. Well, and of course, the biblical answer is yes. Yeah. But then the next was, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? Is there a list of rules in the Bible? Well, <laughs> that's a long discussion. Yeah. But before we get to the list of rules, <laughs> when God 
represents himself to us, he historically speaks through a person. He establishes a, a chain of command, a system of revelation. This is God's nature. The Father reveals himself in the Son. The Son is his, his very image, the brightness of his glory, the express uh, image of his person. And so when God comes to us, he, he introduces the concept of mediator. Now, ultimately, the mediator of all covenants is Christ. And this is the ongoing theme of Scripture. Everything is in and for Jesus. But then within human relationships, that doesn't stop. God sets up um, the chain of command. And here in marriage, you can talk about the relationship of husband and wife and then parents together over against children, over against pets and the house and the yard and all that. But there is a flow of authority. And this point is going to bring us back. To, okay, so I'm a father. I need to know how to raise my children. I just, how is it that I get this from God? And this is where we start talking about the doctrine of Scripture. God communicates, reveals himself in Jesus, but Jesus reveals himself in his written word, which on the one hand we all have, but then he also gifts particular people within church, within family, even within state to interpret, apply. And the rest of us are to be in submission and yet not in an absolute sense because they're not God. And there's a whole lot of discussion that can go on there. It needs to go on lest we make huge mistakes. But we can at least set this over against the pagan idea that I reach out and touch the infinite. I become God and every decision I make, every thought I feel in my heart is now divine and beyond question. That's not biblical Christianity remotely, although it's very popular today. So that's representation or hierarchy. Uh, the next point is stipulations, or mm -hmm. uh, I guess you'd say rules or duties, what we are to do and what we are not to do. In the case of marriage, you'd have all of the to love and to cherish and sickness and in health and all that. Yes. When we say, when we say rules, um, it's easy to misunderstand. I've opted for promises and requirements. That's better. Yeah. Um, I've also sometimes say rules and tools, depending on what we're talking about. When you're talking about people, I think we need to talk about the promises and obligations. Otherwise, it degenerates really fast into a list of do's and don'ts. Biblical wisdom, biblical morality is far beyond, have you kept this yes or no, check mm -hmm. off the box. Have I loved my neighbor? Yes. And who is my neighbor? <laughs> I mean, it was those kind of things that provoked Jesus to some of his most profound um, discourses. What does it mean to, to have kept the commandments? I've kept all of these from my youth up, really. Mm -hmm. Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, come and follow me. Oh, mm, 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 I'm not sure about that one. But let me also introduce the word tools here. Because when a king through his ambassador or prince or general, call someone into his service. You know, when you're called into service, yet, especially if you're called out of the slave market or from poverty, you have nothing, you're called to serve a king, you kind of need some stuff. When I got my first job at Sears, I worked in the shoe department, they gave me a little name badge. You think, that's really exciting. Well, what it meant was <laughs> that I could walk into the back without being stopped by security. You can go into the stock rooms, the storerooms, the, the back offices and such. It was an, an entry into all kinds of things that other people did not have. They gave me a number. Yeah. Which allowed me to I'm access. not a number. Yeah, I was waiting for that. <laughs> they gave me a number that allowed me to access the, the brand new technology called computer cash registers. Hmm. They gave me a handbook of all the codes that would allow me to access that machine. They gave me this little stupid looking uh, mustard colored vest that again marked me off as their employee and all other employees would know that I was such and would respect that fact. And I'm sure they gave me one or two other things, which enabled me to do this job, to act on their behalf. I could take money, I could take hundreds or thousands of dollars from complete strangers because I had these things that marked me off as their representative. These were tools I needed to do the job. We also had paper sacks, plastic sacks. They were still legal in those days. Um, you know, tape of various They still sorts. are in places <laughs> other than California. Yeah. In the free uh, realms. 
Yes. Uh, we the had United stock. States of America. <laughs> we had stock and merchandise to sell. They gave me tools in order so that I could perform the function they had for me. These were a blessing. These were a positive thing for me. It, it gave me status. And, but very simply, it enabled me to do my job. And so when God calls us into covenant relation, whatever that relationship is, he will equip us by his word and spirit and by other externals with whatever we need to do the job. He provides the tools. And, and chief of these is his word. Well, word and spirit, you can't separate them. You shouldn't try. <laughs> we, we want to know how to be a good husband, a good wife. We have the Bible to tell us. We have the spirit to make it real in us. We want to know how to be a good church member, how to be a good pastor or elder. We have the Bible. It tells us. So Bible is not only uh, something we run into at the first well, second level of representation, God reveals and represents himself in scripture. But when we ask, well, what, what is this representation? We come back and we open the Bible again. And it's not just information, but it is a tool, a guidebook for dominion and service, for love, for relationship. So this, this is crucial. We need to not bring it down to the level of mere legality. So most certainly there's a legal side. We need to find covenant. You spoke of a legal and spiritual bond. Or legal and personal bond, but we must we mustn't raise the legal dimension to the point where we lose the personality and the spiritual dimension. So that's the third point. <laughs> Moving on to sanctions or oaths. Oaths and sanctions. The great example here that we'll get to way down the line, I imagine, is uh, Abraham. God has made a promise mm -hmm. to Abraham in chapter twelve of Genesis. Abraham's acted on that. He's acted in faith. We've had the doctrine of justification by faith introduced in chapter 15. But then God formalizes this by a very odd ceremony. But it wasn't odd in the ancient world. Uh, God tells Abram to take a bunch of animals, sacrificial animals, cut them up in bloody pieces and create a path. And Abraham no doubt recognized this. The Hittite covenants are similar. You, you create this bloody path, and then the one upon whom the obligations are being placed walks down that path, saying, in effect, I promise to, to fulfill my obligations, and should I fail, may my body be torn in pieces, like these animals. May my flesh be fed to the birds of heaven and the beast of the field. May Yum. I die a horrible death because I have failed. Self-maledictory oath, maledictory, to speak evil concerning oneself. Now, what no doubt surprised Abram was that he was not required to walk the bloody path. God walked it. And that's something we'll talk about as we talk about the covenant of grace and later as we talk about Abram. But we can see that there is an oath here, and the oath calls it down sanctions. Blessings if we are faithful, curses if we're not. But as we're already getting a glimpse from, from the thing with Abraham, our, our odds of being faithful are zero. We're not going to be. Uh, we had one shot at that in Adam. We failed. And so from there forward, any kind of oath has to fall upon God himself, any oath that's going to accomplish salvation and secure inheritance. And only in terms of that are we then in a position to swear any kind of oath of fealty to God. Mm -hmm. And am I right in thinking that it's with these sanctions uh, that the signs and seals are associated? Yeah, the, uh, the oath is often portrayed or incarnated, embodied in some kind of sign or seal. In Abraham's case, uh, after the initial covenant cutting ceremony, Chapter 17, God imposes the ritual oath of circumcision. You're going to circumcise the foreskin of your sons at eight days old and of any convert who enters the faith. You're going to mark in their flesh the very nature of this covenant in the New Testament, the signs are baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is these things ratify and recognize the reality of the covenant. They are, they're not magic, but they are legal realities, covenant realities that call God to witness and to do what he has said. When we throw ourselves upon God in repentance and say, there's no hope in my flesh. I know I must be born again. Jesus, wash me with, with your blood, wash me with the Holy Spirit. 
baptism witnesses to that, and we are appealing to the reality that's behind baptism, and God honors that, the thing he has pictured, the thing that is written in the gospel. But the signs are always interpreted, and that's another discussion for another time. But when we make the signs stand by themselves, they tend to become magic rites. In the Bible, they're always interpreted by the preached word or the written word. God always tells us what these things mean, but then he gives us these signs and seals to appeal to our other senses so that we not only hear the word, but we feel it as water upon our bodies. We taste it as bread and wine in our mouths. And yet the emphasis is most certainly on the word itself. Right. And that brings us to the final point of the covenant, which is continuity or inheritance, which we've kind of alluded to all along the way, because again, everything is so enfolded on itself in these united promises of God and the structure. But key to the sustenance of a, of a covenant is how it's going to continue. All the covenants that God makes with us in, in Adam and Noah and Abraham, there for for a long time, as David says, when he walks in before the Lord, you've spoken to your servant mm -hmm. of a great while to come. Yeah. Yes. When God said forever, he forever. meant forever. That was, that was quite a while, yeah. Yeah. Well, as we look at succession over multiple generations, and the Bible constantly uses the word generation, not merely years, although it does that occasionally. But the idea is that we're supposed to have children, and they're supposed to have children, and then they're supposed to have children. And this relationship that we have with the sovereign God, the creator, is to be extended and transmitted across time, across generations, from one group of people living at the same time to another group of people who come later and live at the same time, and so on. Some things, some things are involved here. First of all, uh, we got, you got to have kids. You, if, if there's no children, this doesn't work. But also... In the New Testament, it becomes clear that they, there are ways to have children that do not involve natural procreation. It's called evangelism. You can win other people to faith in Christ so that they can be sons, become sons of God as well, even though they're not your family members and they were strangers to the covenants of promise until they heard the gospel and believed. But we, there's this, this basic idea of bringing more and more people into this relationship with God, as we talk about the nature of Zion of the New Jerusalem later on. this Why that is, I think, will become clearer. Having said that, then, rebooting back to the beginning, well, how does this work? Well, it begins with a sovereign God who decrees the end from the beginning. If we were left with this, we would say, okay, how are we going to make this thing work over multiple generations? Well, look at the United States Constitution and see how well that worked. <laughs> it, you know, it did pretty good. It, it had a good yeah. run of 200 yeah. years, more, more or less. You know, well, there, was that civil, there was that Civil War thing. Yeah, um, yeah there was that. Yeah, when, when, when we try to invent something and extend it over generations, we don't do very well. And so it, it requires the sovereign power and faithfulness of God, of his promise, to be a God to believers and their seed after them, generation after generation after generation. And so, well, how does he do that? He does it by his word, in which he reveals himself in his gospel, which promises that if we believe in the Lord Jesus, we'll be saved. And then he, through his Holy Spirit, works out those blessings in the hearts of those who hear according to his purpose, and then tasks them with the same job. Raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and go with other people to Christ. And this keeps working until Jesus comes back, until all of God's elect are saved, and all those for whom Jesus died have come to faith, which will be an exceeding great number that no man can number of every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. That's the plan. That's where the New Jerusalem ends up. So that is the structure of a covenant. This is a good time to pause for questions and tea. One of the things that definitely tempts every generation is the, the, the very simple problem of trying to supplement the things God has promised he will bless. And for the purpose of covenant, he's promised to bless the work of evangelism. He promised to give his spirit for that. And uh, in, the, in the act of child rearing, the same thing applies, even if it's not your biological children, in the act of adoption or in the act of mentorship. And there's 
a parallel here to other things that, that God has blessed. He's promised to grow his kingdom through the dual ministry of the word and the sacraments. And without going too far off topic, there are a multitude and myriad of programs and uh, new ways of, of doing things and rapping for Jesus that <laughs> is not promised to... Uh, <laughs> Although, I mean, that's kind of like in the word, right? Like if you're like, it's a very word focused medium. No, let's not stretch this too far. (laughs) (laughs) Well, rapping would be better than puppet shows for Jesus, at least. Uh, Yes. Or how about flannel graph? (laughs) (laughs) No, sorry. I don't want to hate too much on flannel graph. (laughs) I mean, we've already offended how many people? I I don't. All of the Americans. But I'm throwing the flannel graph users too. Thank you, Brian. Please jump back in to continue that thought. But I just want to say, I wanted to go there and I forgot. I'm so glad you you brought that (laughs) up because you're absolutely right. We're presenting a biblical vision of continuing the faith from generation to generation. But as I said, this all begins with a sovereign God. Well, what happens if you don't have a sovereign God? What if your God's, you know, kind of weak and puny, or doesn't want to interfere, or doesn't want to mess with men's wills? Well, then we have to do it for him. We have to find other ways to Mm -hmm. convince people, since God's not going to do it. His word obviously Mm -hmm. isn't powerful enough. In fact, it's offensive. So what are the ways that we sell any product Mm -hmm. and build a consumer base without being offensive. And the church has tried all of them. Charles Finney was the master of it, right? I was just going to say, we can blame Charles Finney. (laughs) (laughs) He wasn't the originator, but we can put a lot on it. (laughs) He he most certainly wasn't, but he's a good American example. Finney was uh, the guy who said, there is absolutely nothing miraculous about revival. It is technique. It can be done scientifically. And if all of the pastors in the colonies or in the the New Republic had been using these techniques, the millennium would have arrived a long time ago. Oh, no. Uh, Yeah, he was just absolutely certain that it's all basically convinced people to be good with sufficient uh, persuasion methods. And his were not too different from selling vacuum cleaners. You know, it's, it's not that hard to get people to weep. I've done it before teaching. It's not that hard to get people to walk down an aisle or raise their hand. Changing heart is only something God could do. Yeah. And those, uh, those techniques will not, well, I should clarify the Lord may end up using it, but <laughs> those techniques he can. will not have the same return rate that God's will does. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, so if, if the word of God is in there, God honors his word under the most strange and limited of circumstances. He can speak through the mouth of a donkey, (laughs) but he hasn't promised to do so on any regular basis. (laughs) And so when we find out that someone came to Christ at a puppet show for Jesus, we should just give God the honor. Praise the Lord. That doesn't mean we should go out and invest in a lot of puppets. It also means we, we should not use the fact that someone else is doing it wrong to stand on a platform of pridefulness because the fact is that (laughs) you faithfully expositing a portion of scripture has no more power in and of itself than the puppet show. Right. Amen to that. Before we move on, I do have one um, point of interest that I would love to further clarify if anybody has any thoughts. And that was on the the difference between uh, a legal obligation and a personal obligation in this context. Um, when I was just conceptualizing that and listening to you talk about it, Greg, I couldn't help but think that a lot of that would really overlap um, if there is, you know, a true good. But I mean, really, I, th- I think it would go just to the extent of God's law, and then the personal obligations would be separate and not always overlap completely with that. Um, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on just the distinction between those two things. If I understand the question and what you said, I think you, I think you understand the answer. When we say legal and personal, that's not to say there is a legal over here and there's a, there's a personal over there. It's to say there are two heads, two sides, a head and tails to this coin. Mm. There are laws that we can write down that come with God's authority. They come in propositions. We can discuss them. And we can more or less measure our external conformity to them. 
But part of what we're talking about here is, is largely the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus looked and said, you have heard that it's been said. And he quoted scripture. Yeah, they, yeah, the Bible did indeed say that. But you're taking it too shallowly, too narrowly. Let's understand the full scope. Let's understand what it means not simply to not take a knife and run your neighbor through with it. Let's understand compassion and respect for the image of God and laying down your life for your friend and all of the rest. In other words, yes, it's all the law of God, but it's the law of God understood in terms of love, one person for another. But if we just start with the personal, then we run the same thing. So as long as I'm loving somebody and being committed and being there for them, but wait, now we need to say, well, what does that look like? What does that mean? What are the rules? So in saying legal and personal, and I think that's my formula, and, and I won't, it's not inspired, but I think it's true as far as it goes. What I'm trying to get across, at least, is there is most cert we certainly can look at the covenant as a legal document. But if we reduce it to a contract and simply something that requires a number of outward actions that can be measured by taking snapshots and running them into in and saying, look, he did this, he did this, he did this, he's good. We, we don't understand. Marriage doesn't work that way, and our relationship with Christ doesn't work that way. There is the commitment of the heart. Sometimes I've said spiritual bond. But then do I mean the heart or do I mean the Holy Spirit? Well, yes, the Spirit, all the Spirit of God ultimately is the, the personal bond between Christ and us and us and one another. But His Spirit dwells in us and in Him so that we are bone and bone flesh of his flesh, we are members of one body together, and it reaches to the heart. So whichever phrase you want to use, I say these, are, these aren't inspired definitions. But that's what I'm trying to get at. Is, does that help? It does. Yes. Thank you for that. And I'll add to that as well. Um, one of the pitfalls that is ever-present is uh, the temptation towards legalism, of course. So describing this aspect of covenants uh, as being legal and personal, in addition to defining strictly what you can do and what you can't do in so many words, you know, thou shalt not kill. That is pretty straightforward. There's also the personal element that it, it's more, or it's uh, talked about more in the epistles, especially by Paul, that what is not sin to one person but is sin to another can uh, those can both be true at the same time because they fall under the umbrella of Christian liberty. So it's not as simple as just saying some people sin when they do X. Therefore, everyone should avoid doing X because it is sinful for those few people. The personal element comes in when you say it is this person should not do this because it, it is a sin for them. You know, maybe drinking alcohol for them leads them invariably to drunkenness. And so they, sh they should avoid that or it, it, it infringes upon their conscience. In such a situation, being with that person, person B for whom drinking is not a sin, should refrain. And I think that there's a good case to be made that flaunting your liberty in that case around such a person, person could be considered sin. But it's not, uh, the inverse is therefore not true that Person B, drinking at all, is always a sin now. What you're talking about is wisdom. And I think yes. that was, that's absolutely excellent, Brian. I hadn't thought about it in, in, in that context. But that's what we're talking about. We're talking about what if, what if these conditions enter in? When, what happens when two commandments seem to be at odds with one another? What if my brother is a sinner and so am I, but we're sinners in opposite directions and our sins are getting in the way of our fellowship? What then? There's a lot of what ifs where we have to work it out in real space and time with real people, and we can't just throw it off on the abstract principles. I think you've given a good Pauline example of what one thing that that can mean. I think that's excellent. Yeah, that definitely helps as a visual aid to put that in context. I'm glad it wasn't just uh, incoherent rambling. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking about this in the in the context of marriage that you know, David and I have a legal relationship, but it would be so silly to call it only that, you know, we have personal bonds as well. And 
I think we all know marriage doesn't really work if you have only personal bonds and no really legal <laughs> relationship. Yeah, or the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, you know, back in the 60s, that, that was the, the plea against marriage. I don't need a bond, a, a piece of paper to show that I love you. Uh, yeah, you do. No, you don't. But you need, but you need a, a piece of paper to show that you're married. Yeah. Because yeah, loving someone and being married to them are not the same thing. <laughs> And we need to have serious conversation about, well, what do you mean by love anyway? And often it meant, I feel really good about you until somebody better comes along. <laughs> um, when in, in those cases, we have the legal bond that says, yeah, how you feel right now doesn't matter. But in the long ran, r range over marriage, it actually does. And uh, the Bible is full of commandments about loving one another and being ravished with each other's love and enjoying each other's beauty and bodies and all of that, that's, and yet it doesn't get too specific or too graphic. Uh, we, we would help, I, in my family, we love eating each other's food. That's a thing. <laughs> I'm sure there, there, I'm sure there are marriages where that's not a thing. And people go out for dinner almost every night. But that's part of our personal bond because I recognize in my wife something, and I'm, I'm picking one obvious thing I can talk about in public. That's one obvious thing where we can delight in each other and share and grow together, and it pulls us closer together, and it's pulled our kids in after us, because we all like to cook. People ask us, well, what do you mean your the dinner takes two hours? <laughs> well, you actually have to get the food, and you have to make the food, you have to kibitz over the food, and then you have to eat the food, and then you're all these all these conversations that sidetrack us into all kinds of things, and then there's family devotions in there toward the end and prayer, and it did, and then there's cleaning up because generally everybody does the dishes except me because they won't let me. Um, <laughs> my, my girls, my girls are sure they know the only right way to do dishes, and they may be right. You know, but that's that whole thing is part of the of the personal side of commitment and sharing a life together. And that can't be reduced to a mere law code because someone else I, I've, I've said we do this. Not everybody does this. Some people it's art or books or water skiing or spelunking or whatever. But there's more of that personal interchange and growth together. It's very important to, to covenant life, which is why every family is different. Every church is different. Every nation is different. Lewis has some things to say about this, and I think his strength. Mm -hmm. And I wish we had time to get into them. <laughs> uh, so let's wrap up with a quick rundown of the two biggest covenants that we deal with as humans, uh, the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. And maybe we can point out the five points in each of these? Uh, we come to the Adamic covenant. It's been given lots of names, the covenant of creation, the uh, covenant of works, the covenant of life. The Bible does not exactly give it its, give it a name to the point that some people have said, that's not even a covenant because the Bible doesn't call it one. Oh yeah, there's <laughs> that passage in Hosea that says, they like Adam have broken the covenant, but that means something. No, that's almost certainly what it does mean, that it is a covenant. But we're back to the, you know, if it, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and it uh, wears a sailor hat and has a big D on its um, shirt, it probably is a duck. We, we look at what God did with Adam in the garden, and he presents himself as God. Adam is his image. He grants dominion, stewardship to Adam and his wife and to humanity in general. He gives them Attack. He gives them stuff to work with, a whole world, as well as their bodies and their minds and their imaginations and their hearts. He um, lays before them a task, fill the world, subdue it, and glorify it. Keep the garden. Keep the garden. It starts with keeping the garden uh, as a, an apprenticeship. And as the, the twin sacraments are seals, oaths on this covenant, there's, there are two trees. One, eat of this. It's the tree of life. It's, it's, you will continue in life as long as you eat of it. It's a communion meal with God. The other, don't eat of this one yet. It's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we'll, we'll be talking about this, but just in passing now, it is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It is necessarily the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are two ways you can learn good and evil, by not eating and by eating. Either way is going to teach you good and evil, but in very different ways. We'll talk more about that another time. 
And if you continue in this grace that you've received, and it is gracious, it is merciful. God's not obligated to do any of this, but he does. And he makes a promise and commits himself. And having committed himself, if Adam is faithful, if he plays by the rules God has set before him, the life that he's received, he will continue in until the task is done. However many generations, however many centuries or millennia it takes, he will live in life and finish the task. And then, then the next phase, yeah. next level takes place. Level up. Do, do, do. I, <laughs> it's 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 after your time. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Keep it in. Everybody else will understand it. I won't. On the other hand, if he eats of the forbidden tree, then he will bring damnation and destruction upon himself and all of his natural posterity. Now, at that point, there didn't seem like there would be any because God said, "In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Die, and you shall die." But if somehow he were to have any children, they would bear the same curse because he's Adam's this covenant representative. And that's and so we because it involves particular actions he's required to do and not do, it's often called the covenant of works. Uh, I tend to name the covenants after whomever they're made with. But it, as long as we are clear with our terms, covenant of works is fine. So there's that. Well, we know what happened. We've read Genesis. Adam sinned through the instigation of the devil by willful disobedience. Adam took away all of that, all the divine gifts from himself and posterity. And at that point, the story could have ended, and that's what everyone was expecting. God had this great plan, didn't work, oh well, dumped the universe into hell, come up with a better game to play. But then God introduced a different idea, a different principle. Grace also, but he now grace in the face of sin. Before, God was being gracious in the generic sense of giving Adam stuff that, as a creature, he had no claim on. Now, he's got an anti-claim. He deserves death and hell. And yet, God is going to find a way, God knows a way, he just hasn't told us yet, that Adam can escape that judgment and begin, and again, be received into life, into fellowship, into blessing. And it's announced, God announces it. With the garden gate with a promise. Something about, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, Genesis 3, 15 and 16, between thy seed, her seed, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. And God accompanies with that a sacramental sign. You see this animal? Watch it die. Hmm. Here's some clothes from the animal skins. Wear them. Now, put that all together. You got 4,000 years. They didn't know. But as it turns out, mankind had 4,000 years to figure out what in the world that all meant and how it explained how a good, holy, and just God could love and receive sinners back to himself without denying his justice and holiness. And that makes the Bible the greatest mystery story ever written. And God goes on for 4,000 years through all the Old Testament, dropping hints as to what that means and where this is going. But by and large, until Jesus came, nobody really understood it. This we call the covenant of grace. God structured it under the old covenant, in discrete covenants of promise. Well, I say discrete. They're recognizably packaged, <laughs> but they kind of bleed into each into the next. So There's a continuity to them, for sure. There's a continuity even within them. But, God, but the New Testament does speak of the covenants, plural, of <laughs> promise. So we can think of the promises, the covenant made with Adam and his wife at the Garden Gate, later on Noah, and then Abram, who becomes Abraham. Uh, we can think of the covenant with Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai, the covenant with David, and then finally the restoration covenant, one that's often ignored, but was the covenant administration that was up and running when Jesus came. But those are all promises, and the promises get clearer. We get more information, more details as to about how God is going to do this, and who who's the person that's going to make this work. God's our Savior, right? So who's this Messiah? Well, he's a great hero, is he, is he a prophet? No, he's a king. Wait, is he a priest? What? What's he going to do? He's going to reign. Yeah. Suffer? What? No. Um, and and the, the fathers under the older dispensation struggle trying to figure out. The angels themselves tried to look in this and try to figure out what's God up to? What's this, what's this all about? And as each covenant unfolded, people living at that time had to live in terms of it. But every one of them focused on this promise. God's got a plan. He's got a savior. He's the savior. How, what is that? Huh? What? Trust God. Believe God. Believe the promise. 
He will say, he will do what Adam couldn't do. And as everyone keeps asking how, when, where, how, God keeps dropping more and more hints until the day that Jesus comes and gives his life a ransom for sinners, rises from the dead and ascends to heaven and pours out his spirit. And then, oh, that savior, that king, <laughs> that prophet, that priest, that salvation. Oh, let's go tell everybody. And this is the covenant of grace, much simpler than the older covenants. <laughs> Fewer rites, fewer ceremonies, because now we're out of the shadows. Everything's open and clear. God's not hinting and peeping anymore. He's telling us very plainly. And in the light of the New Testament revelation, we can look back at the old and say, oh, you know, you read it against the Christie mystery, you get to the solution, you look back and suddenly it's, oh, it's so obvious. How did I miss that? But along the way, it wasn't that obvious. God <laughs> hid the mystery of Christ for 4,000 years. But looking back, we see it so clearly. And that's a taste of covenant theology. <laughs> yeah. I was saying recently to someone that, ha have you seen the movie, The Prestige, all y'all? <sighs> that's the one I've missed. I have uh, not seen it. I was just going okay. to interject. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you've seen it, right? I, I have seen it. I don't even know how many times now. Okay. Uh, Less than 10. I know it's not that many. <laughs> well, it's just such a... I hear you saying we should see it. Yes. Not necessarily. I mean, <laughs> David says yes. Um, I, say I don't <laughs> love it, but it's an exceedingly well-made movie. But what makes me think of it in this context is always that the movie is about magic tricks. Mm -hmm. And the movie is also one big magic trick. Ah. And so as you rewatch it, you see, oh, of course, how did I not understand this from the very beginning? And yet mm -hmm. you you keep coming back to it. And every time you watch it, you see more. And it, reading the Bible is like that, seeing these covenants. Oh, yeah, they're all the same covenant. It's just one big covenant. Oh, wait, no, but there are seven, but there are one. But so it's it's yeah. a marvelous experience. Definitely. And I think that's all the time we have for today. We've shortchanged the covenant of grace but uh, hopefully we'll be talking about that a lot in episodes to come. Alice, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure thank to meet you. you. So much. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's been lovely listening to you all. Good. It's been great. Well, we hope to yeah. hear more from you in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, also for being here. Thank you, Greg. Thanks to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, thanks to all y'all who are listening. You can send us an email if you have questions or insults or thoughts or comments. If you think we're totally off base, send us an email. If you think you really like the show, also send us an email because we'd love to hear that. That's really encouraging. Um, yeah. Who else do I have to thank? I feel like I'm missing someone the Lord. Well, we thanked him at the beginning. I know. <laughs> Does that mean you can't thank him the second time? How stingy are you with your thanks? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember how I close the episodes, guys. <laughs> what do I say? <laughs> I don't remember what you oh, say. So just it's make dreadful. up something. Thank you all for listening. Hope to see you next time. 